Hey everybody, Grummels here with another DCS video. Now with the summer sale we have going on on the DCS website this week, I got myself a few more modules for DCS and one of them is the Dassault Mirage 2000C, a lightweight delta winged fourth generation fighter. And this might not come as a big surprise, but I really like this plane. I do of course like pretty much all of them. But in any case I think the Mirage 2000 is a great addition to my collection and brings a few new things to the table I did not have previously. So let me give you a bit of an overview of the Mirage 2000C and what it can do and then show you a little mission in it. Now the M2000 module is still in early access and better so there are one or two functions that are not implemented yet but I won't go over that now because I flew the 2000C on the Nevada map in the version 2 of DCS World which is an alpha still and from what I have heard the 2000 is one batch behind in 2.0 compared to 1.5 so I want to look at the plane in 1.5 first before I go over that. So far though I did not have any actual problems with the plane. Well done, let's talk a little bit about the M2000 and what you can expect from the plane. Now the Mirage is the first full module of a fourth generation fighter we have in DCS. I think the next one will be the F-18C from ED, but I'm not 100% sure about that. While we have other fourth gen fighters like the F-15C, the Su-27 or the MiG-29, they are FC-3 planes and therefore not full modules. So that alone makes the 2000 a bit unique at the moment in DCS. The C is the first version of the Mirage 2000. So its capabilities are mostly in line with 80s fourth generation fighters like the F-16A for example. The Su-2000 was initially developed as a successor to the very successful Mirage 3 and the layout of the plane is similar with a low tailless delta wing. Also the first in DCS with the MiG-21 being a tailed delta. In the mid 70s Dossault was working on a new heavy fighter project for the French Air Force known as ACF which was meant to have similar capabilities than the also larger F-15A or F-14 Tomcat entering service at the time, though with a larger focus on strike capabilities than say the F-15. At the same time they were also working on a lighter plane to replace the Mirage 3 and compete with the F-16 on the export market for light fighters. Now the export market was an important consideration here because the previous Mirage had done very well in exports and presented a large means of income. The projections for the chances of the heavier and more expensive AFC on the export market were poor as smaller export customers of course would prefer a lighter and cheaper plane as the Mirage 3 has been. This new light fighter would become the Mirage 2000 and as the heavier AFC project was cancelled eventually the Mirage 2000 became the main fighter not just for the export market but for the French Air Force as well. Now make no mistake here, it being a light design does not mean bad as the Mirage 2000 and other light fighters like the F-16 have proven. As mentioned the Mirage 2000 is a light fighter similar to for example the F-16 and just like the Mirage 3 it was developed to replace its primary focus was with the initial 2000C version we have in the module interception with some ground attack and multi-role capabilities, though later versions expanded on the multi-role aspect. Now the delta wing is of course well suited for high speed flight and the plane is very maneuverable at high speeds. The delta wing design is also capable of high angles of attack, however on slower speeds this wing design also needs a higher angle of attack to produce the same amount of lift. This leads to this wing design producing more drag at lower speeds, as the angle of attack is higher than on more traditional designs. That's something to keep in mind with delta winged fighters like the Mirage. It's capable of impressive angles of attack and a good instantaneous turn rate, but it will lose speed and energy fast when maneuvering at high angles of attack, especially at lower speeds. So you can't stay in a turn fight for too long until you are at an energy disadvantage. In that the Mirage has some similarities to the MiG-21, which also has a delta wing, though a tailed delta wing design. Also because of the engine of the Mirage 2000, which is somewhat unusual. The fighter's M53P2 engine is a turbofan and in its design ease of maintenance, cost and easy handling for the pilot played a significant role. The engine is therefore a single shaft design, meaning that all the fan and compressor stages are driven by just one drive shaft instead of multiple. That simplifies the engine design, it can be built more modular and lighter and the engine is therefore very easy to maintain, even in adverse conditions, for example improvised airfields as might have been used if the cold war would have gone hot and is of course also an argument for export customers. However, 
On the flip side, the compression ratio is pretty low in comparison to similar engines, which leads to a relatively low thrust in afterburner, compared to for example the F110 of the F16 Fighting Falcon, leading to the thrust to weight ratio in full afterburner of the Mirage being not that impressive. So in a fight you want to keep the plane fast and if you are going to turn, try to end it fast, the Mirage turns well just not for very long, you will lose energy fast. Now, as armament we got 4 hardpoints under the wings for air-to-air -air missiles. The Matra Magic 2s on the two autopilots, heat seekers comparable to the Sidewinder, and Super 530D semi-active radar guided missiles comparable to the AIM-7 Sparrow on the inner pylons. Now just 4 air-to-air -air missiles is not that impressive, and was increased in later versions of the Mirage 2000, but for a light fighter the armament at the time was pretty standard, when the 2000C entered service. The F-16A at the time could just carry AIM-9 heat seekers, no radar guided missiles at all, though that capability to carry AIM-7s was added later. And lighter active radar guided missiles came later in the 90s. Now the 2000C can also carry a number of air to ground munitions, giving it some multi-role capability. Unguided bombs like the Mark 82s, rocket bots and also laser guided bombs, though it can't lace its own targets, a buddy has to do that. And last but not least, the Mirage is also equipped with two DEFA 30mm cannons. The guns are similar to the British Aiden cannons and fire the 30 by 113 mm NATO round, which is what the Apache fires as well. Well, that is a bit of an overview of the plane. Let's take a quick look at the mission and show some of its capabilities and how to use it. Now, one thing I noticed French pilots really like doing is flying low. There are a lot of videos out there of Mirage doing some nice low level flying, and this mission will require some of this too. Now here's the scenario. We are playing at Nevada again, and a large formation of OP4 tanks were spotted advancing towards the Groom Lake base, intending to capture that important airfield. Now our forces on the ground, US and French armored units, callsign Anvil, are heavily outnumbered by the enemy units and will need air support, killing lots of enemy tanks if you want to defend the airfield. And this air support will be provided by a flight of Apache Longbow helicopters, callsign Dragon, and two A-10As Voodoo flight are also on the route to provide air support. However, an observation post in the hills north to the Groom Lake facility has also spotted enemy SAM units behind the advancing OP4 tanks, which would make the life of our air support units very difficult. Our observation post reports that we have two SA-8 Gecko mobile SAM launchers about in this area, as well as a SA-3 Goa SAM site which was set up here. Those SAM sites are protected by AA guns too. Now, those threats have to be taken out before our Apaches and A-10s are attacking the armored units. And that is where we in our Mirage 2000 are coming in. We get to play Wild Weasel and attack the enemy SAM units. After that we are to help provide air cover versus possible enemy fighters. Now, the Mirage does not have any long-range stand-up weapons to engage those SAMs out of their range. Luckily though, those older model SA-8s and SA-3 SAMs have trouble engaging targets that fly fast and low, though that might depend on your definition of flying low. So we have to do a little bit of low level flying and attack the SAMs at close range so that our Apaches and A-10s can attack the tanks without being engaged by those SAMs. The AA guns are protecting the SAM sites themselves and should not be a threat to the Apaches when they attack the advancing tanks. Now the Mirage 2000 with its fly-by-wire system is well suited for low level flying and you can be very precise with it at low level. Now in order to fulfill the first part of our assignment and take out the anti-aircraft missiles we carry four unguided iron bombs, Mark 82 Snake Eyes to be exact. Now Snake Eyes have the normal tail unit of the bomb replaced with an automatic air brake unit that extends for air brakes when you drop the bomb, slowing down the bomb to increase the distance to the aircraft dropping them when they impact, making them a good choice for a low level drop, especially at high speeds. Now, the Mirage can also carry cluster bombs, which can be a good choice versus anti-air positions, but they need a bit more altitude than I intend to drop them at to be effective and also while the SA-3 radar units are unarmored, the SA-8 launchers do have some light armor and the small bomblets are sometimes a bit unreliable against them. Since we are expected to provide cover versus enemy fighters after we expand our bombs, we also carry our full air-to-air -air load two Magic 2s and two Super 530s, as well as a centerline drop tank since the Mirage uses up fuel pretty fast. 
Now the Mark 82s we carry are 500 pound bombs with about 200 pounds of explosives and I plan on dropping two at every of the two SA-8 geckos. Still though, in order to take out even a lightly armored vehicle like an SA-8, you need almost a direct hit with one of those bombs in DCS. After all, damaging it isn't good enough, it needs to be destroyed. So we do need to do a pretty accurate hit with those bombs. Another reason why I plan to do a low level attack, as a dive bombing attack is most likely not accurate enough for those bombs to land close enough to do the trick. Dropping the bombs with the help of the ballistics computer from low altitude at exactly the right moment though lets you throw the bombs directly into the side of the target vehicle. In order for our computer to provide us with that solution, it needs some data of course, which can either come from the radar, measuring the slant range to the target, or the plane's radar altimeter. I use the radar altimeter for this high speed low level attacks. This method is of course unreliable in uneven or hilly terrain at higher altitude, as the radar altimeter gives the computer the distance to the ground right below the plane. In uneven terrain this will lead to imprecise drops, but we are in Nevada, it's about as flat as it's going to get, so the radar altimeter works well here. And the lower we are and the closer we are to the target when we drop the bombs, the smaller the margin of error of course. Now you might have noticed that we carry four bombs and I plan to drop two of them on each SA-8, so when it comes to the SA-3 some side we have to use our two 30mm cannons to take it out, but the SA-3's radar is not armored, so that should not be a problem. Now, Groom Lake and the forces there are just coming inside, and I want to approach through the hills to the east of the enemy SAMs to get as close to them as possible while being hidden from line of sight, before flying out over the open desert at low level to search for and destroy the SAM units. We have the radar warning receiver which is already picking up the SAM units to provide us with the rough direction to the SAMs, and luckily in the open desert they should be easy to find. I also fire up my ECM system, though I don't know if it will make much of a difference at this range, and keep dropping chaff in regular intervals to make it as hard as possible for the enemy SAMs to lock on. Now when I break out of the hilly terrain with the radar warning receiver providing the rough direction to the targets, I hope I'll manage to have the first gecko lined up in front of me as I get line of sight of the large open area in which the targets are located, and I can immediately start my attack on the first target. I can also already make out some explosions and smoke to my left from the direction of our defensive lines in front of Groom Lake and the enemy attacking forces, so there is not much time. The Apaches are ready to take off from Groom Lake itself and can be in action right away, but will only take off after we have taken out the SA-8s, so we have to take those out before enemy ground units get too close to the Apaches on the ground. By now we also have the small hills between us and the SAM units which should be directly behind it, and should be hidden from line of sight as well as from their radars. That of course also means that our radar warning receiver will stop updating the direction from which the enemy radar signals are coming, as it is no longer receiving them. But I hope I have a rough direction of the launchers accurately enough to be able to attack them right away, however when I come out over the open desert I don't see the enemy SAM units in front of me as I hoped I would. Looking around I can locate it, the first SI-8 though, it's close to my right as I pass it at high speed. Close but not good enough for an attack right away, so I figure instead of trying to turn around here, I just keep going towards the second SI-8 that should be in the direction further out in the desert and try to acquire that one. I also reduce my altitude to keep them from firing at me. I can spot the SA-8 launcher and my ballistics computer gives me the predicted impact point. At this altitude that should be pretty accurate and I drop right before the circle passes the SA-8, which should throw the bombs pretty much into his side. I can hear the explosion and looking back see some smoke indicating that the target is destroyed. I also take some fire from 23mm anti-aircraft cannons, but those ZU-23 2s are manually aimed and have a hard time hitting a fighter flying at high speeds, though of course it is far from impossible. Now that's the first of our three main targets taken out, and having gained some distance from the one I overflew earlier, I turn around to attack the other one with my second pair of snake eye bombs, while trying to stay as low as possible to avoid being shot at. Now I can spot the second SA-8 again and start to line it up to attack that one as well, while flying over some wires as I come in to attack, which I found somewhat embarrassing at the time. But anyway, I come in to drop the second pair of snake eyes and they do the trick as well, and shortly after we drop the two bombs the Apache flight announces that they are on the way to attack the enemy armor now. 
But we are not done here yet, the SA3 Goa subsite is still up, this one has a longer range than the SA8s and is more a threat to the A10As that are coming in than the lower flying Apaches, but it needs to be neutralized nonetheless. Now having dropped the four bombs I switched to the 30mm cannons and changed to air to ground mode, though while being focused on low level flying I have not much time for extra switchology, so the guns remain in poor side mode and I don't get a predicted impact point. That should not be a problem though at close range, the two Dave cannons both firing more or less the same stuff the Apache cannon fires, but at a much faster rate of fire should destroy the SA-3's radar without any problem. Sadly, this time one of the enemy 23mm anti-aircraft guns is sitting right in my flight path, giving it an easy shot, and I do take a hit from the AA guns as I come into attack, right before I take out the SA-3 guidance radar. Luckily, I don't see any extra warning lights coming on, and it seems we have not taken any serious damage from this hit. The AC-3 SAM site, though, without the targeting radar, is now harmless, and the flight of A-10s is on its way also. Together with the Apaches, they should be able to turn back the enemy armored attack pretty fast. I meanwhile turn back towards our lines at the Groom Lake facility and check the warning light panel again, as well as the engine instruments afterwards to look for signs that I might have taken damage and have to go land. Nothing indicating damage though, just that I'm out of bombs, but I know that already. To the left I can also see the Apaches over our lines. But then our E3 AVEX planes that is circling around over Las Vegas is coming up on the radar, announcing new contacts coming in from the northwest, which is up for territory, so those are most likely enemy fighters. So time to get this bucket ready for air-to-air -air combat. I activate my Super 530D radar guided missiles, though I keep my radar off for now, then I also notice that my external fuel tank is empty, so time to get rid of that by flipping the drop switch over to the left, selecting the drop tank and then dropping it with the trigger. It is advised though to move that switch back to the right after that though, if you don't want to drop your air-to-air -air missiles instead of shooting them. Having dropped the empty fuel tank, I start to turn around and overfly Groom Lake as I slowly start to turn to the northwest again, where the E3 AVAX has first indicated those two new contacts. Now, shortly after that though, the E3 also confirms the identity as hostile, enemy fighter bombers coming in, and they are tasked to intercept them. Two more friendly fighters are also coming in, but they are further out than we are. I at first plan to keep my radar off to surprise the enemy fighters using the AVEX to guide me close enough to be already in fire range when I fire up the radar, but I apparently don't have the right frequency and no time to play with the radio now. Also, my job is to prevent the enemy fighters from attacking either our Apaches or A-10s, or ground units, so I figure showing my presence with my radar might make them focus on me first and ignore the Apaches and A-10s. So I get my radar, which was in standby mode till now, turned on and head in the direction the enemy fighters were reportedly coming from. The Mirage 2000's radar has a pretty decent range, and shortly after firing it up, I already have two contacts on the scope, indicated by the V symbol. Closer than I thought, they would be two, and turn into them. I do have one of the AA guns shooting at me too, but I hope I'm too high and fast for the manually aimed guns to be very effective. Still, I turn and climb a bit to present a more difficult target, then select my Super 530D radar guided missiles again and lock up the first target, but in track while scan mode for now to keep an eye on the second target as well while I do so. When I want to fire the missile though, I have to switch to single target track mode, as the Super 530s are semi-active radar guided missiles. I don't get the radar warning from the enemy planes indicating that they don't have radar guided missiles, but that does not mean they don't have heat seekers, and some of the Russian fighters can fire active radar guided weapons at you using their infrared search and track sensors to provide initial launch information. With the extra information I get from the lock I can see that the targets are a bit below me, and I descend a bit so I can look up at them, and I fire up my afterburner to speed up and give my missiles more energy. Now I switch to single target track mode and engage the first target. I plan to fire my two Super 530s at the first target, getting rid of the heavier radar guided weapons which are not that good in close quarter combat, and hopefully taking out the first target, and then using the Magic 2 heat seekers in close combat mode. My two radar guided missiles do hit the first target and take it out, but since I had to switch to single target track mode to use them I lost track of the other one. Last I saw him on the radar, he was behind and to the left of the first one and I expect the second target to go after me as I attack the lead plane, so I go up in a turn, launching flares and try to acquire the second plane, which I expect to be somewhere behind me by now. However, I can't find him. 
which is a bit unnerving. I assume though that the second plane just kept going towards the objective when I attacked the lead plane, which is a bit unusual. But I keep up some evasive maneuvers for a bit, just in case, because an all aspect heat seeking missile can be fired from all angles and could be coming from everywhere, not just from directly behind. But there really does not seem to be another enemy plane around, and at this point I wonder if he might have even crashed. So I eventually turned back towards Groom Lake, in case the enemy plane went there. While still keeping a lookout behind, just in case. Turning back towards the Groom Lake facility, I do get a quick radar contact, but lose it again. And of course there are a lot of friendly planes in this direction as well, so it could be anything. But I fly in this direction, and so far I see no indication of another enemy plane. And since the one I shot at earlier was flying pretty low, I expect the other one, should it still be around, to also be on lower altitude. I get the contact notification from the AVEX every now and then, but it is hard to tell what, if anything, is enemy and what friendly, like A-10s popping up on an AVEX screen after pulling up from a gun run. Now I can see a A-10 in trouble getting fired at by a 23mm AA gun, but not an enemy plane. And if the A-10 thinks it's a great idea to fly circles around uh, over an enemy AA gun, then that is his problem. However, the enemy ground forces got decimated, and we soon get the message that the enemy attack has been repulsed by now, and we won. All I have to do now is make sure that there are no more enemy planes around. Now, a pair of friendly F-18s has arrived by now too, and they do spot the enemy plane, which was on higher altitude than I thought, and shot it down. So, we are clear and the objective is fulfilled. We took out the SAMs and the Apaches took out most of the attacking tanks, so this is it for this mission in the Mirage 2000C. Now, I hope I could give a bit of an overview of the plane and some of its capabilities. It's certainly a fun plane and with more Mirage fighters coming up in the future for TCS, I would not be surprised if this would become one of my favorite fighter lines. I also really like some low-level high-speed fighter bombing attacks, and I think that mission would be a good example for why. Well, and this is it for this video. As always, I hope it was enjoyable, thanks for watching, and maybe I'll see you next time!